welcome. This is the third of the propulsion detail uh, presentations. I'm Dr. Mike Fabian. I'm going to have the panel members introduce themselves, then let uh, Team Straub take over from there. So. Okay, Jeff Jansen of Honeywell Aerospace and Teams. Ron Flood from the Personal Public Service. I'm here at Constantino for the SF Ultra Flight Research Center at the Air Force well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jenna Humble, and I'm the design team lead for Straub Designs. My teammates are Eric Brown, Chad Reinhardt, Robert Ottenklotz, and Marcus Bever. And this is our final detail presentation. So today we're going to be going over a brief project overview as well as our requirements before we get into the design, feed system, testing, analysis, and results for both of our test articles, the injector assembly and the igniter system. And then we'll finish with our conclusions and recommendations. So I'll start us off with our project overview and requirements. Pyramid Space has sponsored a project, our team, and currently they are working on the design of a one metric ton liquid rocket engine for use as a second stage to orbit, as well as a lower atmospheric booster. We have been given $5,000 of support in order to implement this project. So basic requirements for the engine are as follows. It is required to be pump fed. We are using LOX, liquid oxygen, and LNG, liquid natural gas, as our propellants. As I mentioned earlier, this is a 22 pound thrust engine. We are required to be able to sustain 80% of our max thrust for 400 seconds. We must be able to throttle down to 20% of our max thrust. We must support in-flight reignition, and we must be able to reuse the engine. Our team's scope has been the design of the thrust chamber assembly, or TCA, for this engine. This includes the combustion chamber, the injectors and manifolding system, the igniter, and all required interfacing for this system. We also were required to design the ground test engine or GTE version of our injectors and manifolding system and our igniter. And we created a test stand in order to allow us to water flow test and hot fire the system. For detail design specifically, we had two parallel testing paths. The first of which was our injector assembly. To do this, we had to modify our geometry for ground test engine manufacturing. We created a water flow feed system created CFD models for our propellant, and we eventually tested it. For the augmented spark igniter, we had to redesign for the use of liquid propane. We created liquid oxygen and liquid propane feed systems. We created a thermal model for the igniter, and we eventually tested it as well. So now I'll start us off with our injector assembly design. So we decided to go with two different types of injectors in this assembly. The first of which is an unlike impinging gutlet. In this type of injector, you have two streams of propellant, one of fuel and one of oxidizer that impinge slightly down the combustion chamber, causing atomization and vaporization of the propellants. We chose this because it is the most stable and reliable type of injector that we could use. However, the only problem with this is if we put these injectors close to the combustion chamber wall, we get oxidizer to fuel ratio variations around the combustion chamber wall, which can lead to damage. So in order to mitigate this problem, we also decided to use oxidizer shower heads, which are single streams of propellant directed approximately axially along the combustion chamber. We put these in a ring around the outside of our combustion chamber in order to keep a consistent oxidizer to fuel ratio. We arranged these 14 doublets in two rings of seven, and we have one ring of seven oxidizer shower heads around the outside of our combustion chamber. The image you can see on the right is our final manufactured injector plate. It was CNC by performance powder coating, and then all of the angle holes were drilled on campus by our team members. Each of the oxidizer ports was designed to be 0.067 inches in diameter. This gave us approximately 300 PSI of pressure drop across the injector, which is a NASA standard of 30% of our original operating chamber pressure of 1,000 PSI. We also angled our injectors at 35 degrees for the oxidizer and 25 degrees, I'm sorry, 35 degrees for the fuel, 25 degrees for the oxidizer. This balanced our stream momenta at impingement to enable a, an entirely axial stream after impingement. We also angled our shower heads at 10 degrees towards the wall to maintain an oxidizer 
bridge ratio at the wall itself. In order to utilize this injector system, we also had to design and manufacture a manifolding system. The manifold's job is to take the propellants from the feed system and route them to the injectors themselves. In order to do this, we designed an a zoned oxidizer dome, a fuel ring manifold, and a platelet routing system. Within this system, there are three primary propellant zones. As I mentioned, we have a zoned oxidizer dome, so we have two oxidizer zones. One, which you can see in green, and two, which you can see in blue. We also have a fuel zone, which is shown in red. The zoned oxidizer dome was designed with throttling capability in mind. Because we have such a severe throttling requirement of 20%, we wanted to be able to shut off the oxidizer to one ring of doublets entirely without affecting the performance of the other ring of doublets. This will allow for more stable throttling to a lower percentage. We also designed this to have low velocities of approximately 10 feet per second throughout the entire manifold. This limits the amount of uh, static pressure differences between the different injectors for this zone. The image you can see on the right is the actual physical hardware for our oxidizer dome. It was 3D printed by Stratasys in California using direct metal laser sintering of aluminum. Our ring manifold was designed similarly to our oxidizer dome in that we were focused on having low velocities of approximately 10 feet per second for the exact same reason. We also designed this to get radial consistent flow to limit our inconsistencies between the different injectors. And finally, this is our platelet routing system. This takes the propellant from the two manifolds I just talked about and gets the propellant into the injectors themselves. The top view on the left shows our ports for the oxidizers zones, and the one on the right shows the different channels for our fuel zones. And on the right, you can see the assembled version of our injector assembly with the oxidizer dome on the top, followed by the ring manifold, our platelet routing system, and the injector plates. Now I'll hand it off to Eric Brown for feed system. Thank you, John. As she said, my name is Eric Brown, and I'm going to talk about our injector assembly feed system. On the screen is a summary of the equipment used for our feed system. It can be divided into uh, three main sections. Uh, we have our water flow system, which consists of our water storage tank. Uh, the water storage tank then feeds into our water distribution uh, manifold, which then runs towards our circle. Then we have our pressurization system, which consists of our nitrogen bottle and a pressure, regula and pressure regulator. Uh, finally, we have our mass collector system, uh, the mass collector system consists of the uh, zone adapter, uh, which takes the flow from the individual injector uh, zones that we're testing to a slide manifold, and then to our mass collection uh, containers. Uh, the plumbing diagram behind me shows the, uh, how those individual systems are connected together. Uh, the nitrogen bottle um, pressurizes the water tank through the regulator to our design uh, pressure of 300 PSI. This then pushes the water out the bottom into our water distribution uh, manifold, which then goes to our zone distribution valves. The water storage tank we used was a 27 gallon air compressor tank um, that was already on campus. Uh, we modified it by removing all of the air compressor hardware. Uh, we then installed a 350 PSI pressure relief valve and an emergency dump valve um, to prevent the tank from overpressuring in case of a regulator failure. Uh, we then also modified the, um, the water outlet by removing the drain valve and um, drilling the hole larger for a three quarter inch uh, pipe fitting to connect to our water distribution manifolding. Uh, in addition, the tank was very old and so it had a significant amount of dirt and rust debris inside the tank. Uh, we cleaned it out the best we could, but we figured out uh, we figured it would still have significant fog. So we um, we epoxied a stainless steel screen over the outlet to prevent any large uh, chunks from uh, getting stuck in the feed system. Uh, so from the water tank, it then runs into our water distribution uh, lines and manifolding. The uh, main water distribution line is a three-quarter inch uh, hose. 
which then runs into a 25 micron uh, hydraulic filter. Uh, this filter is rated for 3,000 psi. Um, however, we did not have any flow characteristics for this filter. Um, the manufacturer didn't have any data for us. Um, it then runs into the water distribution manifold, uh, which distributes um, the water into half inch lines, which then have uh, the zone the zone selection screw valves to allow us to select individual zones uh, depending on what test we would be running. The uh, pressurization system uh, starts with our nitrogen bottle. It's a large uh, nitrogen bottle, commercially available. Um, it's regularly hydrostatic tested and commercially filled by Cracks Air provided to us. Um, it's filled with 2200 PSI. We then uh, regulate the pressure down to our test pressure of 300 PSI through a Harris HP750 uh, pressure regulator. This regulator was designed for a 3000 PSI max inlet pressure and allows us to control the outlet pressure anywhere from 150 to 600 PSI. Uh, this regulator was specifically chosen uh, due to its extremely high uh, flow volume um, as well as a fairly accurate um, pressure regardless of what the bottle pressure is. We also installed a ball valve uh, after the regulator to allow us to uh, start and stop the test while still maintaining as much uh, pressure in the nitrogen bottle as possible. So the, uh, after the uh, water runs through the test article, it will then go into the mass collector system. Uh, the mass collector system consists of one zone adapter for each one of our tests, uh, except for the impingement test where we are not collecting mass uh, data. The, uh, each zone adapter has a plate with the uh, um, holes drilled in a specific area to collect mass from the individual injectors that we are trying to collect mass from. Um, it then runs through tubing um, into a slide actuation manifold. Um, the slide actuation manifold has 28 holes drilled in it. 14 of them go to dump, and 14 of them go to the actual mass collector um, containers. This allowed us to actually only collect mass flow for a specific amount of time uh, to rule out the startup and, uh, and ending transients uh, within the system. So it took a little while once we started the test to build up pressure within the system, and then we started collecting our mass once pressure was full. Now I will cover our injector assembly testing. So the purpose of our testing was to validate the original manifold and injector design characteristics. Uh, this started with uh, certification of the equipment to ensure that it could handle the pressures that we were that we were uh, wanting to run, as well as uh, um, meeting our and didn't have leaks and met our requirements. Uh, this then, after the equipment certification, we then uh, moved on to water flow testing. The uh, water flow testing. Uh, allowed us to collect our data, um, which then allowed us to uh, validate our CFD model, which then allow, would allow us to validate our design model. The uh, CFD model validation and design validation will be covered later on in our analysis and results sections. So the summary of our tests that we completed, uh, for our equipment certification, we performed a water feed tank hydrostatic test followed by a uh, test article, an entire feed system uh, hydraulic test, hydrostatic test. Once all of the hydrostatic tests were completed, uh, we then moved on to our water flow testing. We ran an individual oxidizer zone one test, followed by oxidizer zone two test, followed by our fuel zone test, and then an all zone impingement test. The purpose of the hydrostatic test was primarily to verify the structural integrity of our uh, feed system components. Um, and primarily our water, uh, our water storage uh, vessel, as it was only designed to handle, um, it was rated for 150 PSI, since it was uh, only meant for air compressor as an air compressor tank. So we pressurized, we uh, filled the tank with water, uh, pressurized it to 350 PSI, and measured the uh, change in circumference of the tank. Uh, we only um, saw a 1 inch circumference increase around the uh, middle of the tank at 350 psi, and then we and uh, no cracks or failures within the tank. We then released the pressure and uh, 
and ensured that the uh, circumference returned to the original circumference to make sure we didn't have any plastic deformation during the uh, test. In addition, we checked for leaks uh, during the hydrostatic testing. Uh, since we were only going to be flowing water, that wasn't a, main, a safety concern that we had leaks. However, it was uh, it would have skewed our mass collection data. So after our hydrostatic tests were uh, complete, we then moved on to our water flow testing. Both the oxidizer and fuel zone tests were meant to qualitatively, um, qualitatively check the flow rates of each uh, injector. Um, our design test pressure was 300 psi. However, we had issues with our um, with our water feed system, uh, mainly that a 25 micron filter did not allow the mass flow that we needed uh, through it. So we were not able to achieve our pressures. Uh, this will be discussed later on in the results section. Uh, the impingement test was meant to confirm that the oxidizer and fuel actually impinged at the proper distance from the injector face, and also to assess the stability of the streams and the atomization uh, achieved after impingement. And now I'll hand it off to John Humble for the injector assembly. Again, my name is Shona Humble, and I will be going over the analysis of our injector assembly. So for each of the propellant zones that we mentioned earlier, we created four separate CFD models. The first two were 2D laminar and 2D turbulent models. We used these to determine boundary conditions for each of these models to ensure that we would have numeric stability throughout the test on a low computationally intensive model. Once we had both of these models as accurate as we could to the original design, we then created a 3D model using our propellant. We iterated this until we were able to get it as close as possible to our design. Once we had that, we created an identical copy of this model, including the geometry meshing. And we, re we redid the model with water instead of our propellant so we could relate it to our water flow testing. We also uh, note that we did change the boundary conditions. Because we are assuming that this is an adiabatic and incompressible system, all of the mass flow rate is driven by a pressure differential from the inlet to the exit. So the actual magnitudes of our pressure did not matter as long as we met that pressure drop, which is why we believe this method to be valid. So uh, this is a graph of our validation process. We'll start off with our water flow testing, and we can relate that directly to the results of our water model. Because the water model and the propellant model are identical in pressure drop as well as geometry and meshing, we can then compare the results of our comparison with the water model to the propellant model itself and then eventually to the original design, thus being able to quantitatively assess our design based on our water flow testing. These are the results of the propellant model for oxidizer zone 1. We got approximately a mass flow rate of 3 pound mass per second, which is 23% different to our original design. This is to be expected as we did not account for the pressure and line losses due to changing the direction of the flow within our manifold when we did our initial calculations. We also calculated an exit velocity for the injectors of approximately 144 feet per second, which had a percent difference of 11.4% to the original design. Oxidizer zone two was more accurate we had a propellant mass flow rate of approximately 1.8 pound mass per second with a percent error of 8.7 to the original design. This error again comes from the fact that we did turn the flow within the manifold and that was not accounted for in the original hand calculations. We got a, an injector velocity of 155 feet per second with an error of 4.7%. Our fuel was the most accurate in mass flow rate with a mass flow rate of approximately 1.9 pound mass per second and an error of 1.6% to our original design. However, we did have an exit velocity of 360 feet per second with an error of 16.9%. This is a summary of the results of both our propellant and our water flow models, mass flow rates. The top line is the results of the propellant models that I just talked about, and the bottom line are the equivalent water flow 
model results that we expected to validate using our water flow testing. So at this time, I'll discuss the results of our testing. We came up with four independent criteria for determining if we consider our CFD and design validated. For the propellant zone test, we were expecting an overall mass flow rate for the zone to be within plus or minus 5% of the CFD model. We also expected the individual injectors to have plus or minus 10% of the expected value. This change from 5 to 10% is due to the fact that these are very small injectors and small changes in manufacturing will change the characteristics, thus leading to more error within the individual injectors themselves. For the impingement test, we were expecting to validate based on successful impingement as well as having an impingement distance within plus or minus 5% of the design value. So these are the results of the two tests that we conducted on oxidizer zone one. In green, you will see the values that were in fact validated, and in red were the ones that did not meet our validation criteria. You'll notice in test one, the first column, we did in fact meet our criteria for the overall mass flow rate, and half of our injectors met our validation criteria as well. However, approximately half of them did not. We believe this is because we had leakage within the sliding manifold on our mass flow collector system. So all of the mass in certain uh, collectors was not based on specifically that injector, but had some excess from other injectors as well. The second test uh, did not go as nominally as we expected. You'll notice that we did not have an overall zone mass flow rate within our expected values. This is because during the testing, we actually ran through the entire water tank system, which means we had our shutdown transient as well as nitrogen pressurization going through our system during our allotted time span. Uh, this will result in error, as you can see, and we were not able to validate the majority of our components at that time. However, uh, based on the initial test that did run nominally, we are saying that our overall mass flow rate is validated, but our individual injectors are not. Our oxidizer zone 2 test also did not go nominally. We ended up having significant leaks within our manifolding system, resulting in very significant error. Uh, as you can see in the video on the left, we had water spraying out of our sliding manifold, which we estimate to be approximately half the water flow that was supposed to be going into our mass collection system. We also had difficulties with our fuel system. Uh, if you'll recall, I mentioned earlier that our fuel uh, velocity exiting our injectors was 360 feet per second. Uh, we believe that our epoxy that we used to hold our system together would withstand this velocity. However, we were incorrect in that assumption, and we ended up having two of our tubes pop off in significant leakage. Uh, as you can see, we had quite a bit of water spraying everywhere. We ended up shutting down the test for safety reasons to make sure that we caused no damage to the testing infrastructure, which is why we have no numerical data to present to you at this time. It should also be noted that based on the flow rate for this test, our filter was inhibiting the test results as well. We also noticed that we had dirt in our filter and the filter had iced over, limiting our mass flow rate the system. However, our impingement test was completely successful. We achieved impingement on all of our ducklets and we also had an impingement distance of 0.095 inches, which is within 4% of our expected impingement. So we start off with a slowed down version of our startup transient. And then here is it up to speed. So we have dubbed this test an unqualified success. We did validate our Oxone 1 overall mass flow, as well as successful impingement and our impingement distance. 
We were unable to validate our oxone 1 individual mass flow rates due to leakage within the mass collector. We were unable to validate our oxone 2 mass flow rates overall and individually based on, again, leakage within the mass flow collector. And we were unable to validate our, zone, our fuel zone based on leakage and insufficient uh, water supply. This time I'll hand it off to Chad Reinhardt for our injector. Thank you, Chad. Igniter. I apologize. <laughs> As you said, my name is Chad Reiner, and I'll be going over our test igniter today. Um, our igniter is an Aquanet Spark Igniter system. Uh, the way this system works is it is the igniter is a small combustion chamber separate from the main engine combustion chamber. Uh, the propellants are initially injected into this small chamber, where they are ignited using a uh, spark ignition system, such as spark plug. Um, uh, the ignition occurs in the small chamber and then expands into the main chamber. Uh, here we then start to flow the propellants to the main manifold um, where they can impinge, vaporize, and then the combustion from the augmented spark igniter then ignites um, all the main fuel elements to achieve full combustion um, throughout the chamber. So. So here you can see our flight model on the left, as well as our test model on the right. So the flight model is the version that is uh, designed to operate on the main engine um, using our original flight design characteristics. However, for testing capability reasons, we chose to redesign the igniter at the beginning of detail, um, and the result is on the left. So here are some of the design difference, differences between those two systems. Uh, first of all, the material changed from Haynes 214 to a 6061 aluminum. Uh, this was to improve manufacturability so that we could do it here on campus as well as uh, drastically reduce cost. Uh, the combustion fuel had to change from liquid natural gas to liquid propane. Uh, this was because we could not obtain liquid natural gas or liquid methane uh, here on campus uh, as many of the vendors would not agree to deliver it to us. Uh, and propane is readily available. Uh, the mounting for the flight design is such that it uh, mounted to the center of the main engine manifold. Uh, however, this proves a difficult mounting scheme when you're not testing it on the manifold. Uh, so we changed that mounting scheme to be a simple bolt flange that we can mount it uh, to virtually the uh, The chamber pressure we reduced from 1300 psi to 300 psi. This was um, to improve not only the safety of our test, but also our capability of the test. Uh, the systems required to achieve that kind of pressure are not present on campus, um, and if we were to make them, they wouldn't be very safe. Um, uh, we did, however, keep the same pressure drop from the chamber pressure to the exit pressure conditions, uh, and this was to keep some similarities between uh, the two designs. Uh, the design thrust, as well as the chamber contraction ratio, uh, the chamber contraction ratio is the ratio between the uh, diameter of the combustion chamber to the diameter of the throat. Um, these were changed to facilitate manufacturing. Uh, by changing these two numbers, we were able to modify the diameters of both the throat and the chamber to be more consistent with uh, standard drill bit sizes. This meant that we didn't have to have any custom tooling to make, our, uh, to make uh, any of the components. Uh, here you can see all of the test model components. On the left is the test letter manifold. Uh, this is what receives the liquid oxygen and then routes it down into the manifold gasket. The manifold gasket serves both as a seal and as a routing system for the liquid oxygen. Uh, come, the LOX comes in through this right side and then distributes through this horseshoe shape to the two injectors on the injector plate. Uh, these injectors are set up such they, such they are a micron like impinging doublet. Uh, so just LOX flows through them and it impinges inside the combustion chamber. A second gasket is present between the plate, or the injector plate and the chamber. This helps to seal all combustion gases inside the igniter. Um, and then the combustion chamber uh, not only has the chamber, but the uh, fuel limit and the mounting plan. Here you can see the difference, or you can see the Katia model of our igniter on the left, as well as the manufactured model on the right. Uh, all of the manufacturing for this model did occur at Dolph, or all of the main components for this model occurred at Dolph High College, um, so that we could get all of the components in time for testing. So I'll now have to hand it off to Robert Ockenfoss for our uh, Testing infrastructure, sorry. Thank you, Chad. As I said before, my name is Robert Ockin Kloss, and I'll be going over igniter testing infrastructure. Uh, so the purpose of infrastructure is not only to maintain and uh, mitigate any potential hazards that could occur during our test, but also to ensure the propellants that we are needed for the hot and cold flow tests 
are delivered to the igniter at the proper temperature and pressure. It will also allow us to record data, data during the test that we may be able to analyze it later. Uh, this is the feed system layout, uh, pressure dissipation diagram for entire feed system. The locks feed system is on um, the top of the system. Uh, apologies. The locks feed system is on the bottom of the system, and the propane system is on the top of the system. And an extra pressurization tank is used to pressurize the propane system. Um, for the locks feed system, what we have is a locks doer, which is used to store the locks at cryogenic pressure and temperature. It is then fed via a doer hose into the locks feed tank where it self-pressurizes the remainder of the pressure required. Um, for our test, we require about 335 PSI of uh, locks at the actual igniter, so we're looking for about 340 PSI inside the locks feed tank itself. Um, the locks from there feeds into the feed line via a simple ball valve that is controlled by a pulley from our distance. Um, these are two actual pictures of the locks feed tank post-test. On the left-hand side is a picture of the top of the feed tank, we have the vent valve, which is used to vent the remainder of the locks inside the tank and the remainder of the test to basically decrease any potential hazards that could occur with leaving pressurized locks inside a container while we're nearby. A pressure relief valve is on the tank in case the pressure at any point in time reached above 350 psi, it would vent the remaining gaseous oxygen that is at the top of the locks feed tank. And a pressure transducer, if you're able to measure the pressure inside the feed tank at all points of time during the test. On the right hand side is a picture of the lower part of the feed tank. Um, the feed tank is frosted over post-test. Um, we have the fill valve, which is what allows the flow of locks to come from the doer into the actual feed tank itself, as well as the feed valve, which opens the flow directly into the feed line, which goes directly to the igniter tester our fill itself. Uh, for the propane feed system, we had a propane fill, uh, fill tank, which was essentially a propane forklift tank, which stores propane at liquid, um, and stores propane in liquid form. From there, it was fed using a simple propane RV hose into a propane feed tank that was manufactured by us for this test. Uh, since propane could not self-pressurize, we had to use the exact same nitrogen pressurization system that was used for the water flow testing in the injector to pressurize the propane the remainder of the way. From there, the propane is fed into the igniter feed line directly into the igniter tester. Uh, this is a picture of the actual propane feed tank post-test. The propane, as I mentioned before, it enters through a simple RV propane fill line. Uh, through the fill valve into the feed tank itself, and then from there it goes into a simple um, uh, fill valve, uh, feed valve, excuse me, that runs into the remainder of the feed line directly to the igniter and test um, For feed controls, we use six pulleys, five eyelets, and nine pieces of 550 pound test cord, uh, about 60 feet in length, uh, so we were able to control, open, and close different valves throughout the entire test so we could do it remotely not have to worry about any personnel being in the area while any of the tests or pressurization sequences were to uh, run. Basically, as I said before, to mitigate as much hazard as possible. Um, this is the overall testing infrastructure that was out of the bunker the day we tested. Um, the blast shields are in place to protect the locks doer, nitrogen pressurization tank, and the propane fill tank behind the bunker in case one of the feed tanks were to fail and explode. Um, from that point in time, the pulley system can be seen on the lower part of the picture. That was directly routed to the bunker where we were um, sitting during the test that we controlled the entire test during um, the test. I'll now go over feed system certification. So for certification, we broke it up into two different parts. I'll cover equipment certification. Basically during equipment certification, we want to make sure that the equipment that we had fabricated for this test was able to handle the pressure and temperatures that we experienced during hot and cold fire tests before we would actually perform the actual tests. Um, for equipment certification, we wanted to certify that the lock speed tank that was produced in a previous detail design project would be able to handle the pressure that we needed. We hydrostatically tested that tank up to 450 psi, even though it would only be at 340 psi to make sure that it handled the pressures that were needed. Um, the reason for the high hydrostatic pressure is because we did not fabricate it, so we wanted to make sure it was up to spec. The propane feed tank, on the other hand, was manufactured by our team for this test and was tested to 400 psi to make sure it could maintain the pressure propane would need during the feed. Um, we also had a propane fill test, basically to ensure that we can actually flow liquid propane from a forklift propane tank into a propane feed tank, which was essential because we must have liquid propane at the igniter in order to have proper combustion. Um, for hydrostatic testing, basically what's involved is whether the system that's being tested, whether it's the feed tank or the entire system itself, is flooded with water. From there, we use the nitrogen pressurization system that was used to pressurize the propane feed tank 
to pressurize the entire system to whatever desired pressure that was required for that test. Um, during that test, we're actively looking for leaks and making sure that all the fittings are um, properly attached. We had many iterative hydrostatic testing. Basically, anytime we found a leak, we'd stop the test, fix the leak, and then go back and test it again until we had no leaks. For the propane fill testing, basically we just ran a simple test with the propane feed tank, the propane fill tank itself, just to ensure that we had liquid propane actually floating <coughs> and storing inside the feed tank. Um, the best way to uh, confirm that was when we vented the tank, we took a video of the actually venting, and as we see clearly here on the right hand side, you have vapor, uh, propane vapor leaving the tank. I'll now pass it off back to Chad Reinhardt for another test. Thanks, Rob. I'll cover the testing methods for the uh, so as Rob just covered, we have equipment certification, and I'll go over the igniter testing, which includes our water flow, cold flow, and hot air tests. So for the water flow test, uh, this is a full system test to ensure that we can fully can understand all of the flow of um, propellants through the feed tank, or from the feed tanks through the feed lines and into the igniter. Um, the first aspect of it is our fuel line swirl test. So the way the fuel uh, enters the chamber is it's tangential to the cylindrical chamber. Uh, this allows it to swirl around the chamber um, as it propagates down. Uh, the benefit of this is that it cools the chamber and keeps all the combustion more centrally, lo uh, more centrally located so that we can uh, have more material uh, surviving. Uh, so this test helped us to verify that we did indeed get swirling. Um, we did this by observing uh, through the top of the combustion chamber as well as the behavior of the water leaving the nozzle. Uh, the next aspect of the water flow test is our impingement test. Uh, this was to ensure that we did, achieve, did actually achieve impingement of fluid coming through the uh, wax injectors and to assess or ensure that we had stable flow coming from them. So for the igniter hot fire test, the goal of this test is to ensure that we do achieve combustion. That is the main goal of the igniter is to uh, create combustion. Uh, furthermore, we wanted to verify that we, we wanted to verify our thermal and operational design characteristics uh, of the igniter. Um, for this test, we developed approximately a 40 page checklist. This is because we're dealing with uh, oxidizers, fuels, uh, very combustible objects. And so this covered all of our equipment, our procedures, as well as um, our hazard. Uh, procedures. Uh, and then combining this was our cold flow and hot fire test. The cold flow was conducted using the same equipment uh, immediately before a hot fire to ensure that we didn't have any uh, leaks due to cryogenic flow uh, for a hot fire. So this is our planned hot fire sequence. The initial idea was to uh, begin with a hot fire that just had external sensors. This meant that we weren't recording any data from the uh, internal combustion chamber. Um, the main value for this would be our thrust data. We would take this and validate our thrust, um, our thrust numbers in the, uh, in the uh, original design. Uh, from there, we would modify the combustion chamber to receive or to take both temperature and pressure measurements. Uh, using these measurements, we could then validate the rest of the design model um, uh, and ensure that our design model uh, functions properly. However, due to time constraints, um, we were able to only test once. Uh, so we did only get this first, these first two blocks with the external sensors and the thrust measure. Okay, so we did run into some testing issues. Um, first of all, we had a late arrival of our lock steward, meaning that we, could, we had to push our test back to the end of the semester. Um, this is the primary reason for our time constraints. Uh, additionally, we have a very long test setup time as there's many propellant feed tanks, many safety measures to take into account as you're setting the equipment up. Uh, this took about half of a day, so we didn't have time to test over multiple days to get the multiple tests uh, or even the internal sensors. During testing, we found that we had insufficient spark energy in our spark plug for uh, igniting the propellants. Uh, this was solved by taking a short break in testing and finding a much higher voltage source to power the spark plug. And then finally, uh, upon inspection of the components after disassembly, uh, we found that there was a slight clog in the LOX routing system. Uh, this caused a drop in the mass flow rate of liquid oxygen going into the chamber, which in turn uh, lowered our oxidizer to fuel ratio and inhibited our combustion. Here you can see one of our later tests where we uh, had very delayed combustion and lots of external propellants in there.
I'll now hand it over to Marcus for our test data analysis. Thank you, Chad. Again, my name is Marcus Dunn. So one of the main devices we use during our hot powder testing program is the thermal couples. We use seven different thermal couples to, um, to gain insight into the thermal loading experience by our ignition system. Two of these thermal couples can be seen on the top here on each of the propellant feet lines. These propellant feet lines were relatively cold, flux being around negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit, and propane um, ranging around a negative 10 and negative 20 feet. We had three thermal couples that were placed on the igniter body itself. We wanted to have a relatively um, good understanding of the thermal gradients experienced by the uh, test particle itself to compare with the thermal model. Finally, we had two thermal couples placed below our ignition uh, system. One was uh, around the nozzle region, floating in free space, and suspended there. And we moved it outside of the uh, direct path to the flame to preserve the, um, uh, the instrument. Um, however, on the exhaust plate down below, the thermocouple is mounted directly in the path. This would expect, would be expected the thermocouple to be destroyed. However, we wanted to see if we could get some data uh, in the flame itself. Next. So we are uh, happy to report that we did uh, achieve combustion. This particular case was um, achieved during the shutdown of our propellants, specifically the shutdown of our fuel initially. Again, due to clogging of the LOX um, manifold, this uh, decrease in fuel flow allowed us to equalize our optical to achieve our design of a to fuel ratio around 3.1, and thus achieve combustion. So you can hear the end of the cold flow here before the uh, ignition. It was a relatively short fire, but it did allow us to perform some of the types of analyses. The first off is a qualitative assessment of our plume. Um, we have a fairly narrow shape here, suggesting an overexpanded nozzle, likely the result of a lower chamber pressure than the design value. While we had decreased uh, flow rates, as mentioned pre previously, especially as we were in the process of shutting down our propellants, um, we our, uh, it is expected that we had a lower chamber temperature as well. Um, finally, due to variations in the color and shape, um, along with the very short burn time, it was decided that we did not uh, achieve stable and full combustion, or, um, fully developed combustion, rather were very subject to startup and shutdown transients. Looking at the thermal couple data that we um, recorded, there's a very clear mark across uh, the three thermal couples that are mounted directly to the chamber. At 895 seconds, the temperature spikes are around 100 degrees. Um, I know that these three graphs here correspond to the three locations here. Thermal couple one is closest towards the uh, oxidizer manifold up top. Thermal couple two is mid, uh, mid body. Or well, thermal couple three is lower uh, by the exit of the test article. Now. You can see the significance of the uh, cold flow from the LOX and the propane beforehand. However, it is important to note that this cool down is not uniform across the combustion or across the ignition system. For the uh, top thermal couple, we are around negative uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. The next one, around negative 10. And finally, for the one uh, down here, it's just above zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and this is uh, influential in terms of processing our qualitative results. Uh, quantitative results, excuse me. In fact, look, uh, finally, uh, down in this corner, we have the thermocouple that was suspended in free space below the igniter. You can see a very clean spike. This is the cleanest data set that we had um, uh, during our ignition sequence. As it was very short, it's very sharp as well. Again, the impact of flowing liquid oxygen can be seen immediately to the left of that. Now, our ignition event also impacted a pressure of the propane uh, feed tank. The entire pressure profile can be seen on the left graph over here, discussed for the duration of the test. If we zoom in onto the uh, region of time immediately before and a little bit after our ignition event, you can see the impact of both co uh, the cold flow, there's a slight increase in pressure. Um, note that we have a very small mass flow rate, so it's not a distinct or not a very uh, noticeable difference at first. But there is a slight difference there. Um, once the uh, propane valve is turned off, our pressure increases in the tank. And on that upward slope, we were able to achieve ignition in our system. 
So our thrust data, measured through a load cell, was a little um, more difficult to process. There were a couple of issues that we identified during this test. Uh, chief among these was some voltage feedback in our instrumentation and setup. Um, this resulted in some uh, significant noise along the signal, um, some of which could be filtered out. There was also a test standoff binding that occurred along the test standoff itself due to frictional effects along the guiding rails. Um, uh, so in processing the data, there was a significant spike around the time of uh, the ignition event. However, there's a 15 second delay that we've not accounted for. We, so in subsequent tests, the electrical signals uh, were cleaned up by using a capacitive filter. However, more investigation would need to be performed into the test standoff to improve uh, translation below. Okay. Uh, continuing on, I will look into the thermal results and modeling that were performed. Early on in the semester, we developed a thermal model of our ignition system as a way to better understand what thermal loads would be experienced during the ignition. Our expected gas temperature uh, theoretical value was around 5,790 degrees Fahrenheit. We did not achieve, achieve this uh, in this test program due to our program times. That was the theoretical result, the theoretical value. Excuse me. In reference, the melting point of aluminum is around 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, so there was cause for concern. However, there were two uh, very significant limitations of our thermal model. The first was a lack of the gaseous boundary layer along the walls of the combustion chamber. This would be expected to prolong the life of the aluminum by decreasing the heat flux through the wall. But we were, uh, did not know how to accurately model that, as both that and also combustion, uh, the modeling of chemical combustion, are very advanced topics in thermal modeling. It was our hope, however, that the relative thermal gradients along the igniter, both internal and external, um, would still be valid in this model. So a conclusion from this model was that the maximum temperature was um, that would experience, be experienced by our test article the internal of the combustion chamber at the throat of the model. So comparing our theoretical results through the model with our empirical data, there's obviously a very large discrepancy, a several orders of magnitude. However, the data has allowed us to assess the impact of several different characteristics on the performance of our ignition system. Now, again, I mentioned that the cool down of the ignited before top high was not uniform. The possible result of this, or a possible, um, this result of this, excuse me, um, is that in our test article, when we were conducting uh, the hot fire test, the greatest temperature, uh, the smallest temperature difference, excuse me, was between stations one and two. These are two very close together. We were looking at the uh, similar stations on the uh, thermal model. The closest temperatures were actually between stations two and three. There's more um, fidelity that we would like to get there. Additionally, the startup transients that are anticipated to have a very large impact the startup and shutdown transients as well. As a, a stable combustion um, would allow a lot of those uh, transients to even out. And we're not able to achieve that in this test program. And the highest temperature in our test uh, data was at station two. It was the three model, it was at station three, closest to our. Um, how this point of the model. So in conclusion, it was decided that our test data is inconclusive due to a short burn time and a reduced pressure as well. So with that, I'll be passing it back to Jen Hummel to conclude, or to wrap up with our project um, conclusions and recommendations. Thank you, Marcus. Again, my name is Jenna Hummel, and I'll be finishing our presentation with conclusions and recommendations. So in summary, you can see the validation criteria we had for both of our test models. We, for the injector assembly, we validated three out of eight. And for the igniter, we validated one out of four. However, we are still incredibly happy with these results as this is an incredibly difficult project to manage. A few of our recommendations if we were to proceed with this project. For the injector assembly, it mainly focuses on the mass flow collector, eliminating leaking, making sure that our actuator will actually actuate correctly, and then also improve the feed rate in the system by eliminating the resistance of the inline filter. For the igniter itself, we would like to redesign the test standoff so it doesn't have the frictional problems and reduce our thrust data. We would also want a finer propellant feed rate control so that we could accurately get our oxidizer fuel ratio. We would also like to improve our gaskets 
and our measurement capability for all of our sensors. Uh, this was our budget for the project. Of our $5,000, we have about $57 left. Uh, we did come in under budget. However, you will notice we have one item that was significantly over budget, namely the injector assembly manufacturing. This is due to the fact that at the beginning of the semester, we were told we would be able to fabricate all of our components except for the dome manifold on campus. Approximately halfway through the semester, uh, we were told that this was no longer the case, and we ended up having to outsource it to performance powder coating at a cost of $1,800. These are our work statistics. As of today, we are over 1,600 hours for the project and over 140% of our expected hours. Uh, most of this time was spent in manufacturing and testing. At this time, we'd like to thank Eric Heininger of Pyramid Space, our sponsor, as well as Dr. Fabian and Dr. Haslop, who are awesome professors for this class. We'd also like to thank Dr. Ron Madler of the College of Engineering, who helped us out monetarily getting the infrastructure parts for our PA system, which was crucial in getting this project to work. We would also like to thank Dr. Brenda Haven, who was our awesome prelim professor, as well as Dr. Shigeo Heshigara, who helped out with the CFD work. We'd like to thank Mr. Patrick David for being awesome with our manufacturing and the madness that went on this semester. And we'd also like to thank Mr. Daniel Clauser for help with some of the initial water jet cutting for our project. At this time, are there any questions? And you have a body of knowledge now to take forward with you to say, here's what we're going to do better and differently next time. So, great job, okay? Now, if we're firing a real rocket motor failure, we're not being out. Right? <laughs> uh, really good job and, and spelling out and saying, hey, we need to achieve all our objectives, but we got a lot, we got a lot of things to do about this. So that's, that, that's outstanding. We're top of the In the interest of time, I'm going to ask one question. Okay, uh, I can't tell from the picture, how closely together are your fuel and oxygen tanks located? Uh, the pressurization tanks or the feed tanks? Feed tanks about one or two feet apart. So, when you, when you go to Kennedy Space Center, you go on a tour, you go out to the launch pad, and you see the liquid oxygen chain. It's a little bigger. <laughs> with hydrogen tank like three miles away, all the way on the other side of the complex. There's a reason for that. We really wanted to do that. This yeah. is just based on the limitations of the infrastructure we can get. At a minimum, you should probably have them on the opposite side. And I know you have to do some manual uh, adjustments to do things, but just in terms of, of uh, you know, proper infrastructure, you want to have those things. On the opposite side. I'm sure there's a picture of the launch pad out there showing you how far the tank is. Okay. So that's it. That's the only question I'll ask. So great job. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to watch the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I just have some questions on the test set up. I'm trying to make the correlation between the events of failure in the water flow test. How do you deal with the safety and cold to get the fire test to the water test? Because, you know, I, I'd be a little concerned with all that leakage between the two of them. Yes, so the main leakages that we had in the water feed system was on the injector assembly only downstream of the test article. Uh, none of that equipment that was leaking was used for the igniter hot fire. That was a completely different system. So, uh, I'm going to test uh, get this 25 micron program. Yeah. The other stream before, 